Thanks. Uh, thank you, Michael. Let me uh, share the slides here and go through. This is uh, actually a, a very exciting time. I've spent my career being told that there's nothing you can do about neurodegenerative disease, nothing you can do about Alzheimer's, nothing you can do about Lewy body disease, frontotemporal dementia, ALS, macular degeneration, just go on and on and on. And so we've been very excited after 30 years in the lab, and we have a trial that was very successful that I'll show you today that has actually done far better than any of the drug trials for patients with cognitive decline. So I want to show you that now we can really say that Alzheimer's is finally optional. If you get on active prevention or earliest treatment, um, then you do not need to go on to dementia. And unfortunately, so many of us people, you know, wait, 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 and that's been the, the big problem. So let me just start by saying that this is a part of a bigger thing. And I think the people here really recognize this better than just about anyone because mainstream medicine has had a big problem. When I was trained way back in the 1970s and 1980s in mainstream medicine, you know, we write prescriptions. So either you send someone to surgery or you write a prescription and that's basically what you have to offer. And that's great for very simple diseases, pneumococcal pneumonia. You can do very well with a prescription for amoxicillin or for penicillin or all sorts of other uh, you know, cephalosporins, et cetera. But what's happened since then is that we have done very well with these simple infectious illnesses, even things as difficult as HIV and even fairly well with COVID-19. But unfortunately, now virtually all of us are dying of complex chronic illnesses, cancer, heart disease chronic renal failure, Alzheimer's disease, and other neurodegenerative conditions. These are fundamentally different than the simple diseases. They don't respond to a simple prescription pad, one size fits all. So what's happened is we're all watching the problems with mainstream medicine. So the Titanic that is mainstream medicine has rammed into the iceberg of chronic illness, and we're all watching it sink into the frigid waters of failure, and no amount of pharmaceutical duct tape is going to save it. That's been the big problem. And this is why such tremendous work from uh, people like Dr. Furman and, and uh, people like uh, uh, like uh, Dr. Jeffrey Bland and Dr. David Perlmutter and Dr. Mark Hyman and Stephen Gundry and Sarah Gottfried and on and on have really pointed out the a way to a, a better way to do this. And interestingly, we came uh, from the laboratory side of things uh, looking at uh, test tube models of Alzheimer's for 30 years, the surprise was we ended up finding out if you just follow the science, you end up at the same place. You find that, in fact, you have to look at these as complex chronic illnesses, and you need to address fundamental physiological processes. It's not just about writing a, a, prescri a simple prescription, which is not to say that the prescriptions won't be helpful in the long run, but as part of an overall precision medicine personalized protocol. And I'll show you that today. So we really are dealing with a pandemic without a vaccine. That's the big problem here. And so if we look at what's going on with Alzheimer's disease, um, you've got, whoops, there we go. Uh, whoops, that's interesting. Okay, so it won't allow me to hit the next slide. All right, there we go. Okay, so for perspective, uh, COVID-19 has killed over a million Americans, uh, but uh, Alzheimer's will lead to the death in nearly 40 times that many. So this is the big problem, that this is really dwarfing the pandemic. About 45 million Americans will die, of the currently living Americans, will die of Alzheimer's disease. And to make matters worse, in fact, having had COVID-19 increases your risk, and now that's been published and shown very clearly, unfortunately, because there are some of the similar immunologic activation sorts of, of, uh, uh, of pathways. So the problem here is, whereas COVID-19 is a simple disease, as I mentioned earlier, we do quite well with these simple diseases where we can just target one thing. Alzheimer's is a complex disease of unknown etiology. As we'll talk about today, that's been the big problem. People argue about what Alzheimer's disease actually is. It's not just a simple one organism. So we need to understand the fundamental nature of Alzheimer's. We need a model that's consistent with the greater than 150,000 papers that have been published so far and will actually predict 
therapeutic failure. So we really have a sad state of affairs. And you know why is that? So first of all, what's happened? If you go in today and you say, hey, you know, I've got some problems with my memory or some problems with my thinking, some problems with recognizing faces, problems with doing calculation, uh, figuring out a tip, for example, paying my bills, things like that. Um, the doctor may say, you know, um, uh, listen, why don't you just wait because it's probably not Alzheimer's. If you really have problems, if things get really bad, um, then come back and we'll give you a medicine that doesn't work and you're going to die. It's a horrible, horrible state of affairs. Of course, we want to get on active prevention. Of course, we want to go in early. And as with all chronic illnesses, you want to start on treatment, either prevention or earliest treatment. Second problem is when the doctor does evaluate you, he or she will get very small data sets. Look at a few things like your like TSH, B12, and uh, not too many more things and not really look at what's driving the problem, which is so critical. And then this other thing is, you know, adherence to this outdated claim. There's nothing that will prevent, reverse, or delay Alzheimer's. You can actually see that on websites. Uh, and this has been the claim for years and years and years. And of course, now with published data shows very clearly that that is no longer the case. And then of course, when people do uh, advance and they go into a nursing home, nobody says, look, all the children should be evaluated extensively and go on an active prevention program. You can literally stop the problem with the current generation if you will just do that. And the statistics show it's very sad. Patients spend an average of $350,000 and actually with with inflation, it's now actually uh, significantly more than that. Uh, but the bottom line is a tremendous amount uh, that is being spent before people die of Alzheimer's. And of course, a lot of this is from nursing homes and things like that. And we, that leaves the patients and their families destitute frequently. So this is a horrible problem and we can do far, far better. And then the other thing is this insistence on treatment with monopharmaceuticals. Okay, I'm just gonna write you a prescription for Aricept or Namenda. Um, these things are, are do not have efficacy. Uh, the ones like Aricept uh, have a brief period where they help a little bit. And that's been shown that the people who went on that actually five years later were doing overall worse than the ones who didn't. And then, of course, the antibodies. And you've heard, I'm sure, recently about donanumab and lucanumab. As I'll show you, um, those do not make people better. Um, they slow the decline a little bit. With They have all sorts of side effects a uh, micro hemorrhage in the brain. Uh, a few people have died from these things. Um, so uh, this is not an optimal approach. We need something that gives you sustained improvement in cognition as opposed to just slowing your decline a li little. So let me mention that one of the big problems is that people come in very late and there are really four major phases of this disease or stages of the disease. And people virtually always wait to come in till the last two instead of coming in in the first two. And if they would just come in earlier, there's so much that could be done. So telling someone that they have mild cognitive impairment, which is the third of four stages, is like telling someone, don't worry, you only have mildly metastatic cancer. It's a relatively late stage of the underlying pathophysiology. So you don't wanna wait for that. So let's talk about the four phases. Number one, you're asymptomatic. So you know, we all used to think of this as the disease of our 60s, 70s, and 80s, but it's really a disease of our 30s, 40s, 50s, and early 60s. It just gets diagnosed 20 years later. From when this starts to when you get a diagnosis is on average about 20 years. So you do go through an asymptomatic period. So many of us, whether, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, or even 70s, many of us are in the early stages without even knowing it. Now you can show that with PET scans and spinal fluid. And now the good news is there are some new blood tests that we'll talk about in a few minutes. People say, well, I'm afraid to get the blood test. What if I find out I'm in the early stages? No problem. You can get treated and do very, very well. So don't stick your head in the sand and wait for it to come. During that time, as I mentioned, you will still have an abnormal spinal fluid and PET scan. If you don't do anything during that time, you'll go on to phase two, which is subjective cognitive impairment. And by definition, this means you're still able to score normally on cognitive tests. But often you'll notice that there are some changes your spouse noted, may notice, some coworkers may notice. The important thing about SCI is that on average, it lasts 10 years. So you have a tremendous window of opportunity. 
we see virtually everybody who gets treated for SCI returns to normal. So please, if you have problems, don't wait. As I said, by definition, cognitive symptoms without abnormal testing. The third phase is mild cognitive impairment. So this again, relatively late stage of the problem. By definition now, it means that you are not doing as well on the cognitive testing, but you still have intact your activities of daily living. You can pay your bills, you can drive your car, you can talk to people, you can groom and things like that. About five to 10% of people with MCI will convert to full-on dementia each year. So again, please don't wait if you develop this. It's the final phase that is actually the dementia phase of Alzheimer's. During that time, your activities of daily living are affected. And so you may have trouble with paying bills or driving your car or grooming or recognizing faces or things like that, or doing the things that you're doing um, each day, toileting, showering, things like that. The diagnosis, therefore, is typically made about 20 years after the initial changes. So we want to get people to come in earlier and earlier and show there is a tremendous amount you can do about it. So it really concerns me when people say, oh, there's nothing to be done. That's absolutely incorrect. And that's been published now repeatedly. So I want to say a little bit about the semantics. You know, what is called success? Because we've all heard recently about the recent drug successes. Here's what they mean. When you develop... MCI, that's the third stage, or dementia, which is where these drugs have been tested and where also our clinical trial was tested. If you don't have any treatment, then on average, you lose about three and a half points per year on a 30-year scale. So whether you talk about the MMSE or the MOCA test, for example, you lose somewhere around it. Now, some may lose a little less, some may lose a little more, but that's the average. For the drug aducanumab that was given that was given accelerated approval. Now, none of these has been given full approval yet uh, by the FDA, but they've been given accelerated approval. So aducanumab, uh, you can see about 22% slowing of decline. That's all, it doesn't make people better. It doesn't stabilize them. It just slows their decline a little bit. Lacanumab uh, was 27%. And donanumab was one test, one uh, trial showed 32% slowing, one trial showed 36% slowing. That's the one that just came out recently. So these have a very, very modest effect. And as a comparison, what did better in terms of actually making people better? Number one, extra virgin olive oil alone did better than these. Number two, uh, ketones. Professor Stephen Kinane from Canada, very nice data, published data on ketones alone showing improvement. So they, they did better with them than these drugs. Third thing, combined metabolic activators. This was just published about two months ago. Um, and this was a couple of different things that, that, uh, that uh, increase metabolic activity. And I'll show you why that's so important. And then finally, the best of all is the a protocol we developed, which is called Recode, um, which is a precision medicine personalized protocol. And as I'll show you, it's based on what's actually causing the disease. And therefore, it's different for different people. You want to look at what's actually causing the problem. And that actually made people better. And if you stay on it, it continues uh, to it continues to improve you. And in fact, we've had people now who've been on for over a decade who are still doing very, very well, who started way back in 2012, which is when the first patients started this. So I'm not sure how many people have seen Alzheimer's brains before. Um, you can see here the tremendous atrophy. So you get a shrinkage of the brain and therefore the spaces where the spinal fluid are actually shows, for example, the ventricles, you can see that they actually get bigger. And one uh, point to note here is right here, you can see this is a little region within the pons that's in your brain stem. Uh, and this area uh, is actually called the locus ceruleus, which basically means um, the area of blue. Um, and you can see the darkness here. And this is what actually goes first in Alzheimer's. And this is the area that sends out projections of norepinephrine. So it's like the adrenaline for your brain. One of the reasons why probably when you see people with Alzheimer's, they're often a little slow. They're often looking around for answers. They're, they're slowed down. So you lose very early on, and you can see here, if you look at the bottom here, you can actually see the loss in that blueness and that darkness uh, of that particular uh, region, the locus ceruleus and the pons. 
Um, then, of course, entorhinal cortex. This is area critical for memory. These are all beginning to degenerate and uh, ultimately uh, much of the cerebral cortex. And if you look at the pathology under the microscope, first thing, of course, this is all related to synapse loss. And that's the most important thing what's, that's happening in Alzheimer's disease. You are losing the connections. You have about 500 trillion synapses in your brain. So you have a remarkable supercomputer inside your brain. These are beginning to be lost as you develop Alzheimer's disease. And in association with that, you see three things that are striking within the brain. The first thing is you see this accumulation right here of, this is called amyloid, and this is largely related to a single peptide that we'll talk about and why that is important, but why it's not the only thing that's, that's driving Alzheimer's. And when it's been talked about as the cause of Alzheimer's, there's far, far more going on than just amyloid in Alzheimer's disease. The second thing you see here, these are called neurofibrillary tangles. And what they look like is someone took a nice big neuron and shrank it down and filled it with this dark substance, which is exactly what happened. You have phosphotau, and we'll talk more about phosphotau in a few minutes and what you can do about it. Then the third thing here is that you see inflammation, and it's especially activation of the innate immune system and especially the memory part of the innate immune system. And that's critical because when you have a response, normally what happens, of course, is you initially have inflammation, you have activation of your innate immune system. That's the evolutionarily older part of your immune system. And then literally it hands off to your adaptive system. So now you're coming up with your B cells and T cells. These are the ones that are more specific that are gonna now root out the pathogen and get rid of it. And this actually then turns down the innate, turns off the inflammation, clears the pathogen, and then you reset. The problem is COVID-19 and Alzheimer's actually have something in common. In both of these cases, you activate the inflammatory part, but you don't get enough activation of the innate part, of, of the uh, adaptive part to clear the pathogen. So either because, for example, you're in ill health, as we know with COVID-19, so people then continue to have this activation of the innate system, and what happens? They die from cytokine storm. In Alzheimer's, the same story, but instead of cytokine storm, it's cytokine drizzle. You have this chronic activation for decades of the innate immune system, and your, your adaptive system is failing to clear this, either because you have had continued exposure to things, that's one common reason, or because you're in poor health overall, or many other reasons that we'll talk about in just a few minutes. So this is the problem and we need to address this as early as possible. So as I said earlier, the key issue is what is it? What is Alzheimer's? This has been the problem, trying to develop a drug to get rid of Alzheimer's without understanding what Alzheimer's actually is really makes no sense, but that's what's been going on for decades. There is no agreement, interestingly, among the experts on the disease. The epidemiologists show us many risks from early menopause. If you have, if you have an early, for example, um, if you have an early oophorectomy at the age of 40 or younger and you don't have hormone replacement, you double your risks for Alzheimer's. Even though the Alzheimer's comes many years later, you actually double the risk. Low vitamin D, herpes simplex, insulin resistance, hypertension, metabolic syndrome. These very, very different risk factors are all risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. I mentioned the pathology just a minute ago. The genetics, over 50 associated risk genes, they're now actually closing in on 100 different risk genes. The most common one is ApoE4. And so it's something we should all know. We should all know our genetic risk. And interestingly, recently a geneticist said she would not want to know her genetic risk because there's nothing you can do about it. As I'll show you today, nothing could be further from the truth. We should all know our risk and we should all get on active treatment or prevention. Microbiology, interesting. There are many pathogens that have been associated with Alzheimer's uh, from things like P. gingivalis uh, from poor dentition, T. denticola, herpes simplex from the lip, uh, HHV6A, which comes in through the sinuses, uh, Lyme disease, spirochetes, uh, other tick-borne illnesses, um, various fungi, candida. All of these things have been associated with 
Alzheimer's disease, but it's not just one, and that's been the problem. And then finally, the translation, you know, what, what happened? This represents a field of greatest medical failure. Why has there been such failure? If you come in with Alzheimer's, if you come in with ALS, if you come in with frontotemporal dementia, the doctor will tell you there's nothing you can do. So let's develop a treatment. Let's look at what you'd want to do in an optimal situation. And let's look at, you know, what do we need to look at? So people have said many different things about what this is. People have spent their whole careers working on the idea that this is just about amyloid. Let's get rid of the amyloid. And you've, as I showed you a few minutes ago, you get rid of the amyloid, it doesn't make you better. Um, it may slow your decline just a little bit, but it doesn't really make you better. Uh, some people believe this is all about tau, others that it's prions, type 3 diabetes, chronic herpes simplex, on and on and on. None of these has led to an effective treatment. So what do we need to do here? So what do we have to explain? We have to explain these disparate risk factors that I mentioned before, all sorts of different things. The many risk-associated genes, the amyloid, uh, the, the, there's clearly implicated, there's something going on with this amyloid, and yet it fails in the drug trials again and again and again. The age-associated risk, it just goes dramatically up, and especially for people who are now 65 and over. Although interestingly, when I was training, uh, we never saw people who were in their 50s with Alzheimer's. Now it's one of the most common things we see, and even in their late 40s. So this is turning out to be very common. And actually there was an epidemiology report about two years ago showing that indeed the, uh, the risk uh, and the, the uh, incidence has climbed dramatically in the 40s and 50s over the, just the last 10 years. And then interestingly, there is a, a mouse that develops Alzheimer's disease that simply has in its genome an antibody to nerve growth factor. So we need to understand why that would cause that problem. And then these aggregates, and, and doctors will tell you, oh yeah, it's the aggregates, it's A-beta or it's tau or it's TDP43. These are all present, by the way, in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's. Over half of Alzheimer's patients, when you look in their brains, have these aggregated proteins, but not just amyloid, not just tau, another one called TDP43 and another one alpha-synuclein, which is actually characteristic of Parkinson's disease. So why do you get all these aggregates? And then of course, the remarkable failure over 400 clinical triers, trials. And then the fact that yes, these things do uh, increase themselves. And so the idea of prions, a uh, Nobel Prize was given to Professor Stanley Prusner at UCSF from his work uh, on prions, showing that these are proteins that beget more of themselves. So they're almost like sub-viral particles, little things that beget more of themselves. We need to understand why that is and what role does that play in this disease? And then the high incidence and prevalence, why is it so common? So any accurate model must be predictive and it must be internally consistent with all the different data, all the different papers, and most importantly, make people better. That's the key. So here's the problem. As I said earlier, simple illness, there are gonna be lots of things. If you get pneumococcal pneumonia, we're probably going to do very well for you. Could be that you've got some alcohol on board that actually increases your risk. If you've got diabetes, that increases your risk. If your B cells aren't doing well, for example, if you have multiple myeloma, and there are many others. But for, as for physicians, the fact that the pneumococcus is so much more important than any other thing, we have gotten away with just treating you with antibiotics and ignoring all the things you've been hearing about from people like Dr. Furman and these other critical, critical things that we need to address. Now, that simply isn't the case when you come to chronic illnesses. So if you develop Alzheimer's, one of the risk factors is insulin resistance. Another one is the pathogens I mentioned. Another one is anything that is associated with inflammation. So your NF kappa B, and you can literally trace a molecular pathway from NF kappa B to the production of the amyloid that we associate with Alzheimer's disease. Mercury is another risk factor. Mycotoxins, another one organic toxins, homocysteine, and you go right down the list. There are dozens and dozens of things. And as you can see, none of these is head and shoulders above everything else. So we can't simply write a prescription that's gonna get rid of Alzheimer's just by targeting one thing. That's the fundamental problem. So we therefore need to look at what's causing this for each person and then address those things.
So let's look under the hood and I'll show you why we do what we do, which has worked better than any other approach so far and why we've uh, d uh, done the trial that we have. So in your brain, in your, in your 10 to the 11, so you've got 100 billion neurons, as I mentioned earlier, 500 trillion synapses. It's really quite remarkable. And so you've got this molecule called APP, which is amyloid precursor protein. And this is a really interesting switch. This thing is literally gauging where you stand. When things are good, you have enough hormones, nutrients, you don't have too much inflammation, you've got enough energy. This thing is cut at a single site and it produces two peptides, one for outside the cell here, one for inside. So this is the cell membrane and the neuron here. You can see here inside, outside the cell. Things are good and it tells you you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna make new connections. And by the way, this is the same sort of thing that we saw in our country when we did, when we had the pandemic in early 2020. And I thought it was interesting that the WHO, of course, has just declared the pandemic over. Uh, of course, people are still developing uh, COVID-19. So on the other hand, when things are bad, this same molecule is cut differently at three different sites. And now you've got two things on the outside and two things on the inside. And by the way, you can see here's the amyloid. This guy right here is the thing that makes up the amyloid. But there's much more to the story, as you can see, than just that. So literally, just as our country switched in its mode and said, okay, in early 2020 said, stay in, don't go into work, you're going to socially distance, you're going to shelter in place. And of course, we went into a recession. We changed the nature of what we were doing in our country. Your brain does the same thing. When it is doing well, it is making and storing connections. When it now gets exposed to insults, pathogens, severe stress, insulin resistance, reduced hormones, reduced blood flow, reduced oxygenation, reduced mitochondrial function, on and on. It basically says, okay, I have to go into a protective downsizing mode. And therefore it flips over to producing these guys, which now go and say, okay, we're gonna pull back. And for example, amyloid beta is a wonderful antimicrobial. So it kills not only uh, not only bacteria, it actually kills viruses and fungi. It's quite striking. So what that means is when we look at these chronic illnesses, they are fundamentally signaling imbalances. And it really tells us Alzheimer's disease is ultimately a network insufficiency, as I'll show you. So when we get osteoporosis, what happens? We know that our osteoblasts, these little guys right here, are not doing as much work as the osteoclasts. This is this multinucleated thing here. Normally, you're putting down some bone, you're picking up some bone, you're putting it down, you're constantly remodeling it, making your bones nice and strong. But of course, as we get a little older, we, we have an imbalance between the blastic and the clastic part. Cancer, same idea. In this case though, where the cytoblastic activity exceeds the cytoclastic activity, typically because You've been exposed to carcinogens, smoking, organic carcinogens, on and on. And so they actually damage the DNA. They change this balance and cells start growing, unfortunately. What we discovered in the laboratory is that Alzheimer's is no different. You have a whole set of things that are synaptoblastic that are helping you make your brain more synapses. You can learn new things, do new things. Unfortunately, they are chronically exceeded by the synaptoclastic signals, which are various insults, and we'll talk about those. So what that means for the engineers in the group here is that your probability of getting Alzheimer's is proportional to an integral over time. So you're developing this over years. Now, this doesn't tell you what test to order. The good news is this is about the same as four things, things that are causing inflammation, things that are causing toxicity, things that are reducing your energetics and things that are reducing trophic support. And the take home message here is you can reduce Alzheimer's mainly in 90% of it plus to two things. It's too much activation of the innate immune system. So immune activation and too little energetics to cover that. So you, you've got this beautiful supported brain, but it is living on the edge. It's living on what you are giving it. And as you now give it less and demand more of it because you've got ongoing inflammation and toxin exposure, you are now 
unfortunately, making it so that it has to do the same thing that our country did during the pandemic. So you're now cramming it into a smaller and smaller space, unfortunately. What this means is if we were gonna develop one drug that would do something for Alzheimer's, it would have to look like this. It would have to do all these different things, which is a huge order for a drug. So we really need to look at protocols so that we can heal these various issues. We wanna reduce the inflammation, get rid of the things that are causing it, and then we wanna increase the energetic support. If we can accomplish those two things, we can make people so much better. And we see it again and again and again, and I'll show you the results of our clinical trial where we saw exactly that. So what I tell patients is, you got a roof with 36 holes. We got to look, a drug is a really good patch for one hole, but it's not going to do all the things that you need to do. It also shows that people get it for different reasons. As you can imagine, some people because there's too little energy, some people because there's too much inflammation, some people both. So there are people who get this mostly because of infections. Some were what we call atrophic, they have reduced hormones, nutrients, and growth factors. And then some people, we call this glycotoxic, and we call it type 1.5 because it gives you both. It gives you inflammation because of your glycated proteins, but it also gives you an atrophic response because you have insulin resistance. So your brain does not respond to insulin. And when we used to grow neurons in the, in the lab, uh, you always had to include insulin, transferrin, and selenium. These are the so-called ITS. These are the critical factors to grow neurons in a dish. They have to have insulin. So as you lose that effect, unfortunately, the neurons don't do well. And then toxics, what we call type 3, can be inorganics, can be organics, can be biotoxins. And then vascular, this is a common, common contributor. And then finally, traumatic. And then if you actually look at what happens when you have head trauma, amyloid is an early response to the head trauma. So I wanna spend just a couple of minutes talking about the most important and the most common gene that is associated with Alzheimer's because there are 75 million Americans who have a single copy of APOE4 and there are about 7 million Americans who have two copies of APOE4. Now, if you have zero copies, and that's three quarters of the population, your chance of getting Alzheimer's during your life is not zero, it's about 9%, but it's not too high. If you've got a single copy, and again, 75 million Americans are in that situation, the vast majority don't know it, we should all find out and get on active prevention so we don't have a problem. And of course, everyone heard recently about Chris Hemsworth who found out that he has two copies, so he's in the toughest situation and really, of course, this is gonna be on active prevention. So single copy, your risk goes up to 30% for your lifetime. Two copies, it goes up to 70% approximately. And there are some that it's even higher depending on other genes, some that's a little lower, again, depending on other genes. So it had been clear for years and years and years. You start out with APOE4, you end up at the other end with Alzheimer's disease, but not clear how, what takes you from APOE4 to Alzheimer's. So we spent years in the laboratory looking at this. How does this actually work? And what we found was absolutely fascinating and showed us a lot about evolution, about short longevity versus longevity, about Alzheimer's disease and about the God gene, as this thing has so many effects. So if you go back five to seven million years, you go out to, to the savanna and the trees five to seven million years ago, what you have is you have the simians and they actually don't have APOE4. They have a simian APOE, which actually has a different characteristic than APOE4. So this was actually associated with the leap from simians to hominids. Here, so you can see here, there was a relatively small number of changes. So it's remarkable how similar simian DNA is to hominid DNA. So literally, God touched the simians, changed very few things in their DNA, and you ended up having the hominids. Very different scenario. And of course, when I, I told my wife, you know, my, my DNA overall is more similar to a, a to a chimp, male chimp DNA than it is to yours. And she said, well, duh, of course, you know, you're, you like the three stooges, you like ESPN, you know, that so does the chimp, et cetera. So we are remarkably similar. Now, interestingly, what has changed, much of it is related to guess what? Inflammation. So part of what allowed us to come down out of the trees, walk along the savanna, 
stub our feet, you know, puncture our feet, get wounds, uh, eat meat that was raw, that was full of microbes, fight with our food, fight with our brethren, all had to do with lots of inflammation. We live in a more pro-inflammatory, at least when we first came down out of the trees, a more pro-inflammatory state than the simians. And so we actually needed that. And interestingly, ApoE4 was the primordial gene for 96% of our evolution. It's just been ApoE4. And it's just been in the last 220,000 years, ApoE3 appeared, and then 80,000 years for ApoE2. So here you can see the striking differences here. ApoE4 looks like columns on a house. And that's because this arginine, which has a positive, uh, uh, whoops, sorry, here, that's because this arginine here, 61, which has a positive charge, interacts with glutamate 255, so which has a negative charge. So it holds these together. This was called by Professor Maley, who discovered APOE. This was called domain interaction. Now you can see here what happened then 220,000 years ago, a new mutation appeared in hominids, cysteine-112, which interacts with arginine 61. So now this looks like a nutcracker instead of looking like columns, quite different looking molecule. So as I said, we've all been ApoE4 just until relatively recently, 220,000 years ago, and then 80,000 years ago, ApoE2 appeared. And now the most common one is ApoE3 instead of ApoE4. So ApoE4 is a pro-inflammatory gene. Very helpful. If you live in a third world country, you're going to live longer and do better if you're ApoE4. But if you live in the US, for example, then in fact, you're going to have additional inflammation. So, okay, we know what to do about that. There's a lot you can do. If you don't do anything, on average, you're, you have the increased risk for Alzheimer's and you have, you have the a slightly shorter lifespan. So what we discovered is that ApoE4 binds to receptors and that had been known before. But the surprise was it actually interacts with a molecule called RELA, which is related to inflammation. It's part of NF-kappa B. And surprise, these actually go into the nucleus. They bind to 1,700 different sites on the DNA, and they actually turn down. These are transcriptional repressors. They turn down things that are normally turning down inflammation. So they actually allow your inflammation to stay up for longer. And if you look at all the different genes that are controlled by ApoE4, you couldn't tell a better story for Alzheimer's. It has to do with inflammation. It has to do with aging and SIRT1. So it actually turns down SIRT1. It has to do with neurotrophins. It has to do with disassembling microtubules and pulling back on your neurites. It's remarkable how much related this is. So I wanna show you some success stories when we actually do the right thing good things happen. So here's a woman, 68 years old. Um, she's actually now been on this uh, for seven years. She presented with paraphasic error. So she was having problems with what she was saying. She would say the wrong thing. She had some depression. She struggled with her computer work, completing a gingerbread man, confused her clock hands. And it really scared her when she forgot to pick up her granddaughters. She actually went in and got on a drug trial. She had a positive amyloid PET. So she was a diagnosis of MCI due to Alzheimer's disease was made. So she was already in that third phase out of the four. She scored a 24 out of 30 on the MOCA. So that's significant MCI. This was actually uh, a professor. So she had fallen a long way to get to a MOCA of 24. Her hippocampal volume was only 14th percentile. So she began on a clinical trial for a drug that removed amyloid. And each time she got the drug, she clearly got worse. And she would kind of slowly fight her way back to almost where she was. And then she'd get another injection a month later. So after eight treatments, she left the trial and she said, this is making me worse, not better. So she then had further evaluation. She failed her visual contrast sensitivity, which suggests she has been exposed to biotoxins. Her C4A was high, shouldn't be over 2830. Her TGF beta 1, high, shouldn't be over 2380. So she had all the markings of exposure to biotoxins. Indeed, she ended up having biotoxins. She had been exposed to mold and mycotoxins. So she began on our, our protocol. She included a plant-rich, mildly ketogenic diet, 
This is called KetoFlex 12.3, and I'll, I'll show you more about that in just a few minutes because it's an important part of the overall uh, of the overall approach. You you need to address multiple things to get people back. In other words, you're literally addressing their synaptic network to improve them so that they can actually make and and use synapses again, literally, so that they can learn once again. She was uh, she had, was treated for Marcon's. This is the multiply antibiotic resistance coag negative staph. Um, she went on detox among other modalities. And let's see how we're doing on time here. Okay, good. All right, so. Okay, so her symptoms resolved. She did very, very, very well. Once again, she could speak, she could find her words, she could cook, shop, tell time, build gingerbread man, no longer forgot to pick up her granddaughters. Actually, her granddaughters said they were really impressed at how much better she'd gotten. They they noticed it. Uh, her mocha went to a perfect 30. Her hippocampal volume went up from 14th to 28th percentile. And she's remained stable for six years. And now we're in, she's in her seventh year. So here's, there we go. So here's a guy whose family history was positive. Both parents, APOE, he also had a single copy of APOE4. Amyloid PET was markedly positive. FDG PET was typical for Alzheimer's disease. Hippocampal volume was reduced. Neuropsych testing uh, showed that again, he also had MCI and you can see why he had it. So his HSCRP, his inflammation quite high. It should be less than one. We'd like to see it more like down like 0.2 to 0.5. His is up almost 10, almost cysteine. We should like to see it at seven or below. He was at 15. His vitamin D, we'd like to see him at 50 to 80. He's at 21. His testosterone was low. His thyroid was low. And he responded metabolically, cognitively, volumetrically to the approach that we've taken. His neurologist said he's now normal. He's done very, very well. And you can see here just this dramatic. His fasting insulin improved from 32, is very high, to eight. Now, eight is still not perfect, but it's far better than he was. His HSCRP, again, it's not perfect, but it's much better than he was. His homocysteine came down, his vitamin D came up. He was doing very, very well. And actually his hippocampal volume, it went up dramatically. Oops, there we go. So his gray matter volume actually went up by 23%. So this is uh, you know, striking improvements in all these different areas. So let me talk for a minute about the uh, precision medicine trial for Alzheimer's. So this was done with doctors Anne, uh, uh, Anne Hathaway, Kat Toops, and Deborah Gordon. Uh, Anne is uh, right here in Marin County in California. Kat Toops is out in the East Bay, and, and Dr. Deborah Gordon is uh, up in, uh, in Oregon, up in Ashland. Uh, and three fantastic physicians, so I'm really honored to have done this trial. And we're now actually just starting a second trial at six sites, so I'm very excited to work with with uh, Dr. Hathaway again, Dr. Toops. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Gordon has retired, so we uh, unfortunately couldn't uh, couldn't have her be involved. I wish we could have, uh, but we now fortunately have Dr. Craig Tanio from Hollywood, Florida, Dr. David Hasse from Nashville, uh, Dr. Nate Bergman uh, from Cleveland, uh, and and uh, and Dr. Christine Burke, who is uh, from Sacramento. Uh, so this is going to be a fantastic trial. But I want to show you about the first trial. And this was a proof of concept trial, just had 25 people to show, can we actually make people better? And so this is the first trial in, in which instead of predetermining a treatment, the contributors were identified and then targeted. And you can see this trial on clinicaltrials.gov. It's registered at clinicaltrials.gov. And as you know, with all these previous trials, what happens? People end up when they say ahead of time, okay, we're going to treat people with this, whatever it is, without knowing ahead of time what's causing the problem. So we actually looked at what are the things that are actually causing the problem for each person and then address those. So we got, because this was a protocol, multiple pieces to it, it got denied by the Institutional Review Boards in 2011, got denied again in 2018. We finally got approved in 2019. We completed this in uh, 2020, actually it was published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. So it's freely available online. You can look at all the data. You can look at everything freely available online in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. And actually that part came out in 2022, back in uh, August of last year. So as I said, small proof of concept trial. We took people who had MOCA scores of 19 and above. So what this meant was they either had mild cognitive impairment 
or they had early dementia. These weren't end stage dementia. So we're when we're interested separately in that because there's more you have to do, but these were people who were in that third and early fourth stages. We treated them for nine months and then we compared that to historical outcomes because there's a tremendous amount that's been known about what these people actually, the, the curve that they're actually on. As I mentioned earlier, you lose on average about three and a half points per year. So we sought to look at the root cause contributors. So we looked at pathogens, we looked at toxins, we looked at their genetics, we looked at their nutrients, their trophic hormones, their, their trophic factors and hormones, their immune responses, et cetera. So the goals for this, number one, we want to improve their energetics. Again, because that's the critical denominator here. We want to get these people into mild ketosis. If you're measuring by blood, one to four millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate. If you're measuring by uh, breathalyzer, for example, the Biosense breathalyzer would be one of them. You want to get above seven, preferably even above 10 uh, on what they call ACEs. Now you're measuring acetone instead of. But um, blood probably a little more uh, on a moment by moment basis accurate, but they, they, either one can be excellent for telling you that you are getting successfully into ketosis. And then cerebral blood flow, we want to improve that. We want to improve the oxygenation, the mitochondrial function. And then we want to make sure that you are metabolically uh, adapted, so that you're, you're metabolically flexible. You can literally go back and forth between burning ketones and burning glucose in your brain. Insulin sensitivity, we want your HOMA IR to be 1.0 or lower. We want to make sure you have enough trophic support. We want to make sure that you resolve inflammation and prevent further inflammation. And of course, the most important thing, remove the source. Um, are, do you have inflammation because you have leaky gut? Um, do you have some mast cell activation? That's a common association. Um, virtually everyone who is having cognitive decline does have activation of their microglia. So we want to bring that back down. So things like resolvins, very, very helpful to bring that down and then determining what's causing it. And then treating the pathogens and optimizing the microbiomes, not only the gut microbiome, but also the oral microbiome. If, you, if you've got uh, high amounts, for example, of P. gingivalis or T. denticola or P. intermedia, uh, or uh, F nucleatum, any of these things are associated with periodontitis and they can migrate not only for associations with cardiovascular disease, even have associations with cancer, but they actually can migrate into your brain. And what does your brain do when it responds? It makes amyloid to cover these things and sequester them for the rest of the brain. So again, what we call Alzheimer's disease is really a response to these various insults. Then we want to detoxify from organics, inorganics, biotoxins. If you're exposed to mercury, we want to make sure that you can detoxify there. And then interestingly, people do the best with some mild stimulation, whether they use light stimulation and some people use V-Light or neuronics and there are other things to do. There's, of course, transcranial magnetic stimulation. There's something called MERT which is another form of magnetic uh, stimulation. And of course, brain training is another good one. All of these things can be helpful once you've done the right things to support the brain. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, you when you get this cognitive decline, you typically have a mismatch between your innate system and your adaptive system. We wanna bring the innate down. We wanna allow the adaptive system to clear out the problem, whatever they happen to be. And then ultimately, after we do these other things, we wanna bring down your amyloid. And you can do that with things like curcumin actually binds amyloid quite tightly and helps to reduce the amyloid. Now, these anti-amyloid drugs are being used in these high doses, which is unfortunate. What we'd like to do ultimately is do all the other things right first and then use small doses of these things to slowly remove the amyloid from your brain. As it is currently, you go in there as a monotherapy in these drug trials, you grab the amyloid and you rip it away. You're doing it with antibodies, so you're creating some degree of inflammation. You're also taking amyloid, which actually helps to patch blood vessels, and you're literally ripping. It's like, it's like ripping a patch off a tire. And so no surprise, you get these micro hemorrhages very commonly in the trials. And then finally, we want to regenerate what's been lost. These people have lost synapses. So we want to support that. And that can be stem cells. It can be intranasal trophic factors. It can be optimizing BHRT. All of these things 
can be used and are helpful to regenerate these lost synapses. And again, you don't want to wait until the neuron itself has died. You want to get in early. So in this trial, we included MOCA scores. We included CNS vital signs. And, and again, MOCA scores, here, let's go back to here. MOCA scores are zero to 30. What's good about the Montreal Cognitive Assessment or MOCA is that it is something that tests multiple parts of the brain. So it's looking at executive function. It's looking at verbal memory. Um, it's looking at um, things like, uh, like switching uh, and looking at calculation. So multiple areas of the brain in a very simple test that just takes about 12 to 15 minutes to administer. Now, CNS Vital Signs is an online approach. It's much more sensitive to the MOCA. So the MOCA, very good for people who are relatively affected. CNS Vital Signs, very good for people who are minimally affected. So putting the two together, we could really get a good dynamic range to see where people stand. And let's see how we're doing on, okay, we're doing great on time. Okay, so the MRI. Uh, we want to know what does your brain look like? And most important, we want to know what are the volumetrics? We want to know, has your hippocampal volume gone down? And interestingly, we see it improve with people when you do the right things. So if you look at the neurocognitive index, these people improved over time. And again, this is very different. If you look at a drug trial, what you're going to see is going from here, down, 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 but a little, hopefully slightly more slowly. In this case, we actually see people go up. So they improve their CNS vital signs data. They improve their MOCA scores. And you can see here, the pandemic started right here. So you could see actually a few people did drop off. The good news, we still had many people who did extremely well. So there was a statistically significant difference with an improvement in these people over the nine months that they did this. If you look at their metabolic status, goes hand in hand. They improved their met uh, metabolic status. They improved their CRPs. They improved their hemoglobin A1Cs. And they were, these were statistically significant. Now their HOMA IRs improved, but they, they didn't reach statistical significance. We didn't have follow-up HOMA IRs on enough of these people, unfortunately. But it was clearly improving in the ones that had it. Their triglyceride to HDL ratios improved. So their lipid status improved. Their homocysteines improved their vitamin Ds improved. And these were all statistically significant in their improvement. So if we looked at MOCA scores, as I mentioned, 76% of them improved. The neurocognitive index from the CNS vital signs, 84% of them improved. The subtests, there were improvements in verbal memory, executive function, psychomotor speed, and on and on. Their AQ20, this is interesting. So the AQ20 is something that the, the partner uses to say, is this person better in this area or that area? And they have a scale from much worse, a little worse, no change, a little better, much better, so-called Likert scale. Uh, and so we had the partners gauge, did they actually see improvements of these people? And they did see a statistically significant improvement. Then we also looked at their brain training. All of them improved on their brain training scores. Then we also looked at their MRIs, and their gray matter volume, which was very interesting because that actually got bigger. People who've already been diagnosed with MCI or dementia clearly decrease their gray matter volumes between two and 4% per year. These people actually got bigger. They did better than people who are just normally aging. Then their hippocampal volume shrank very slightly, but less than people who are normal who are aging and much less than people who have cognitive decline. So across the board, striking improvements. Now, what is associated with good outcomes? What's associated with bad outcomes? Not everybody gets better. Why is that? So what we've seen over the years, the following, it's easy to make people better or easier to make people better when they come in early. The earlier they come in, the better. The people who will come in for prevention we have not seen a single example out of thousands. We've not seen a single example of someone who started on prevention, did the right thing, and still developed dementia. Now, to be fair, it does take years to develop dementia. Maybe we'll see it someday, but so far we haven't seen it. For the people who then had SCI, 
virtually 100% of these people improved. Now, we didn't include the SCIs in this trial. We went further. They were the ones who we only included people who had MCI or early dementia. Once you start dropping down uh, 16 and below, it is tougher and tougher to make people better. We have seen some people with MOCA scores of zero improve. We've even seen people go from MOCA scores of zero to nine. They can dress themselves again, speak again. So it does make a big subjective difference, but we've never seen anyone go from zero to a perfect 30. That's my goal. We like to be able to take people from zero up to 30. There's more that we'll need to do clearly. So if you can get people to come in when they still have MOCA scores of 18 or above, it's easier to make them better. And I should mention a very similar trial with very similar results is about to be published. Uh, this was carried out by Dr. Heather Sanderson from San Diego. Um, they did, again, very much like our protocol, very much. In fact, uh, she was actually one of the, the early students that, that came when we started to offer this as training. And she's done a fabulous job and set up Marama, which is the first assisted living facility that uses this protocol. She's had some wonderful results. She also then uh, did a trial and people got better just as they did in our trial. So I look forward to her publication. She actually took people down to MOCA scores of 16, but she saw the same thing. As they were lower and lower, it was tougher and tougher to get improvements. The second thing is when you have people who have clearly addressable metabolic abnormalities, the people who have high HSCRPs and low vitamin D, things like that, no surprise, they are easier to make better because you can address those things. When you don't find what's causing the problem, it's, it's harder to make them better. The third thing, having a health coach and a supportive family. We've had a few people where the family just said, we can't believe it, it's just not possible, forget it. And no surprise, they always were working against the own, their own family member. Uh, and we've actually unfortunately had a few where the family was waiting to inherit large sums of money and they really didn't wanna see the person get better, which was very sad to me. So you wanna work with a health coach and a supportive family. And at the same time, people where the family is supportive um, have done very, very well positive attitude and compliance, doing the right things, don't give up. We've had people just like, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna live this protocol for nine months and people see that they can get much, much better. And then after that, it gets easier and easier. And then continued optimization. So as an example, one person did very well for about five years and then started to have some sliding, said, okay, something is being missed. Turned out she had two things that had been missed at the beginning. One of them was a, a tick-borne illness, Babesia, and the other one was exposure to mycotoxins. And when those two things were treated, she's done well once again. I mentioned earlier mast cells. Beware, because some of the people uh, will do well if they have mast cells. If you treat the mast cell uh, cause of the inflammation, and interestingly, there are some, some drugs like Ubrelvi and uh, Nurtec that are anti-CGRP. They're actually made for people with migraines, but this is one of the things that's associated with mast cell activation. And so one of the, the, the points that was made by Julie G, who is a, a citizen scientist, was that in her mother, they giving her Nurtec actually improved her cognition dramatically. Now she had some mast cell activation. So it's something to keep your eye open for. And then ketosis. Again, just as Stephen Kinane showed, very helpful. And then lack of severe toxicity. So people who have severe toxicity, you got to stick with it. You just got to keep going and they'll slowly improve, but it may take a few years. People who've had long-term symptoms where they've had problems with cognition for 10, 15 years, it is tougher. They've lost a lot of synapses. You have to remember the decline is associated initially with a chemical loss of synapses. They're still there. They're just not functioning, but a functional loss of synapses. But ultimately, you have an anatomical loss. And as you're losing these neurons, it's tougher and tougher. And as you have more and more atrophy. <clears throat> and then improvement in metabolic markers, just as I showed you for the trial. Very helpful. On the other hand, features that are associated with continued decline poor compliance, lack of interest. People who said, we've had a number of people who said, well, yeah, I'm gonna try a little piece of this, but I really don't wanna to do too much. Well, of course, they're not gonna do very well. Severe toxicity with continued exposure. 
people who refused to leave. One of the people in the trial had severe mycotoxin exposure in her house. And she said, I'm not leaving and I'm not remediating. And no surprise, she was one of the very few people in the trial who did not improve. And then the people who have single digit MOCA scores with many years of decline. Again, they've lost more, it's tougher to bring them back. My hope is that as we go along, we will be better and better at doing that. And then, as I said, lack of support from family and health coaches, failure to identify the key contributors that are actually driving this. However, as I mentioned, we have had some surprising responses of people with very low MOCA scores doing well. We have one that I'm dealing with right now uh, with a health coach, and, and the person has a MOCA score of zero, but dramatic improvements uh, with her husband noticing, yes, she's part of the family again. Yes, she can take care of herself again. Yes, I can talk to her again, even though she's not able to do MOCA testing. So you can still make a difference in some of these people. So how do we make Alzheimer's optional? First thing, encourage everybody to get evaluated. We all know when we turn 50, we're supposed to get a colonoscopy. Well, don't forget your brain. If you're 45 or over, and certainly if you've had it in your family, I recommend even 40 or over, identify and address the risk factors. It's easy to do. You can get some of the blood testing. You can get you can go on mycognoscopy.com, get blood testing, get an online cognitive assessment. It takes about 25 minutes. It's easy. And then only if you have symptoms already, you should also get an MRI with volumetrics. <clears throat> if you develop symptoms, get an evaluation. Do not wait. This old-fashioned idea that, yeah, you know, just wait because there's nothing we can do. Nothing could be further from the truth. If we could get everyone to come in during SCI, virtually nobody would have to get Alzheimer's disease. No, virtually nobody would have to get dementia from Alzheimer's. We need to increase the sensitivity. You know, you look at someone with an MMSC. Uh, this is really good for people with dementia. It's virtually worthless for people in the earliest stages. This is why these online, very sensitive cognitive tests are really important. We wanna catch early, early on and say, you know what, things are changing a little. Another way to go about that is electrophysiology and uh, Dr. Dave Hagedorn and his wife uh, have done a very, very good job with developing electrophysiology and being able to look at patients for very early on and see changes, for example, in things like uh, P300B uh, and theta-beta ratio, quantitative EEG changes, things like that. And then we want to utilize, to optimize the efficiency, we want to have a hierarchical approach to make this public health we want to do have everyone get on some basics. And then a few people will slip through the cracks. Okay, then they need to get more extensive evaluation and treatment. And then a few of those people may, may not succeed. So if you do it that way, you can you have a very efficient public health program, which is what we're very interested in doing now. And then using computer-based algorithms enhanced by AI, we can get better and better outcomes data, better and better looks at what's actually, the, what are the most critical things to do. So I want to spend a minute just talking about the diet because there's so much misinformation on this and people are doing all these crazy things. We have to come back to the fundamental biochemistry. This is a network insufficiency. You're not supporting that 500 trillion synapse network because you have ongoing immune activation and or you have a reduction in the energetics that are supporting this tremendous network. So we designed, here's what the actually works biochemically to make things best. What does it take to keep your synapses in good shape? So no surprise, it is an anti-inflammatory, mildly ketogenic, plant-rich diet. And you can do this if you're a vegetarian or a vegan. You can also do it if you're an omnivore. Either one's fine, but it is plant-rich in either of those cases. And this is what's given best outcomes. So the critical paradox here is this is a network insufficiency, but it's fueled by excess, excess simple carbs, excess processed foods, excess exposure to toxins. That's what's fueling the problem. But we can't just tell people, oh yeah, do a whole bunch of fasting because you have to remember they are starving. Normally, as you know, you can feed your neurons 
with glucose or you can feed them with ketones. You should be able to go back and forth in an optimal setting. As we age, we lose both of those. You can't feed them with glucose because you are insulin resistant. In fact, that's what the PET scans show for Alzheimer's patients. The signature for years before you have the dementia is a reduction in glucose utilization in the temporal and parietal regions. But also you're not making ketones because you've got the high insulin, insulin resistance, which is preventing you from making and utilizing ketones. So we need to restore both of those and diet, exercise, sleep, stress, that's the beginning of the way to restore those. And so we've developed something called KetoFlex 12.3. So for best outcome, we need both insulin sensitivity and ketosis. In other words, metabolic flexibility. Be careful if you're dealing with a patient who has a BMI less than 20, let's say a BMI of 18 and a half. We see this all the time. They may be frail. They cannot do well with long periods of fasting. They may not have much fat to burn. So you want to start with some exogenous ketones to help them. So it's a plant-rich, mildly ketogenic diet with optimal fasting, and that's typically 12 to 16 hours at night. So no surprise, it's easier to start with someone who's actually a bit overweight. They've got fat to burn. They're insulin resistant. You can actually help them to tone down that ongoing inflammation. So this is a high fiber, high in phytonutrients, anti-inflammatory gut healing diet. Uh, and of course, uh, organic, so it's low in toxins. It's a high fat, intermediate protein, low carb, no simple carb diet. So no grains, no dairy, uh, and no simple carbs. Wild caught fish, not farmed fish pastured eggs, pastured chicken, grass-fed beef. And the, the meat side of this is you know, intermediate. So we've got, we developed something called KetoFlex 12.3. And I'm really enthusiastic because so many people approached me and said, hey, uh, you know, it's a pain. How do I look for all this stuff? How do I put this together? Uh, and you can follow yourself on a chronometer, which is one good way to go. But thankfully, uh, finally, uh, Nutrition for Longevity, which has done such a great job, developed these keto flex. You know, so you can literally just get them. And these are coming out actually in about a week, coming out May 15th. So, and they're relatively inexpensive. So you can just get these and at least helps you to get started. And to and here's what it looks like to do all the right things. And I actually tried them myself. I was surprised at how well they did uh, with uh, with taste, and I was surprised at how how well improved my ketone levels. So really nice thing, and I'm I'm truly grateful to Nutrition for Longevity. Okay, so let's finish up. Let's talk a little bit about what's new, uh, and are we doing on time here? Okay, what's new? There are lots of new things going on. This is really, I have to say, this is an exciting time. Uh, we should get to the point where these neurodegenerative diseases are all preventable and especially early on reversible. They should not be the death sentences that they have been over the years. So you probably heard about the two new drugs, lecanemab and donanemab. I mentioned already um, these at their best slowed the decline slightly in association with microhemorrhage, uh, cost of about $25,000 plus uh, per year. Uh, it caused brain, uh, uh, not just brain hemorrhage, but also brain uh, edema, swelling, um, and both of them have led to a few deaths. So I'm not too excited about those. Interestingly, homotaurine, uh, which is now being looked at as a drug, um, actually looks a little better. One of the things it does, and they, they use this in the trials at 300 milligrams per day, uh, either 100 TID or 150 BID, I was pretty impressed by the trial. So this prevents the A beta from oligomerizing. So you have a less toxic form when you do make the A beta. Now, I wouldn't use this alone, but with all the other things, it's one way to help yourself to decrease the oligomerization of the A beta and to make it a little less toxic. Now, if you've got a lot of exposure to microbes and you need those toxic oligomers, oligomers to now kill the bacteria, you're not doing yourself any favors. But for people who've removed the source, this one actually has some promise. In its initial trial, it failed, but it was shown that for people who are ApoE44, it did seem to have an effect. 
So what the, the drug company has done now is actually to develop a precursor and they're, they're testing once again, and they would like to, to market this. I'm not sure that you would need to have the precursor. You may be able to do fine with the over-the-counter homotaurine. We'll see. Then, as I mentioned earlier, combined metabolic activators, and there was a nice paper published on this just a few months ago. This combined four things, L-serine, nicotinamide, riboside, N-acetylcysteine, and L-carnitine. Now, my concern with this one, they're only targeting the energetics. They're not targeting the immune system. And they only looked at people for several months. What about a year later, two years later, three years later? We, we found the approach we've taken. We have people now, as I mentioned, over a decade still doing well. So I'm a little concerned, but for short term, for improving the energetics, this looks pretty good. The one other negative is they used massive doses um, uh, L serine, I mean, gram, you know, over gram quantity. So that I have a little concern about that. But again, it supports the idea that this disease is about immune activation and reduced energetics. Um, I mentioned the randomized controlled trial, which is at six sites. It's literally just starting. We've already had the soft launch. So if you live within one hour uh, of those six sites and you are early on in the process and you've just had some uh, changes, mild cognitive impairment, for example, um, and you haven't already gone on our protocol, because if you've already gone on it, you've already uh, you know, you've already done that. So you need to be, you know, as they say, a, a virginal when it when it comes to treatment, um, then we'd love to have you be part of the new trial uh, that's uh, that's starting. So if you live within one hour of Hollywood, Florida, Nashville, Tennessee, Cleveland, Ohio, Sacramento, California, uh, East Bay in Cal of uh, East Bay area near San Francisco, uh, or in Marin County, just north of San Francisco. Those are the six sites. And then I mentioned the KetoFlex 12.3 from Nutrition for Longevity. Uh, I think this is going to be a fantastic way for people and people in assisted living facilities and, and independent living facilities. Uh, they don't have to worry about all the shopping and, you know, what do I do to this? So I think this is going to be very helpful for their cognition. And then recent paper that came out, and this is the work of Professor Rick Johnson. Uh, both uh, Dr. David Perlmutter and I were uh, co-authors on this. Uh, but this really is the long-term, uh, very uh, elegant research of Professor Rick Johnson from University of Colorado. And what he showed was quite interesting. There is a mechanism that we have developed during evolution that allows us late in, in the fall, as we're getting ready for winter, you know, we're eating tons of fruit. Now, you know, this doesn't mean you shouldn't eat a piece of fruit. That's fine. It, it means that you shouldn't go out and eat 200 pears, that sort of thing. Because when you have increase in fructose, and this can also be because of high glucose. So unfortunately, people who have high exposure to glucose also get this because of the interconversion, the aldose reductase uh, mechanism. And what uh, Dr. Johnson showed is that this phenomenon uh, decreases your ATP. So it's basically taking your system and saying, I'm going to have to winter without much food. So therefore I'm going to turn down my energy. Well, we already know what happens when you turn down your energy, you increase your risk for Alzheimer's. And he showed so many parallels between this response to fructose and what we call Alzheimer's disease. And again, it fits in perfectly to what we've been saying. Anything that increases your inflammation, which this does, or decreases your energetics, which this does, can increase your risk for cognitive decline associated with Alzheimer's disease. So I'm uh, very enthusiastic about uh, Professor Johnson's research. And then you may have heard about the new blood tests. And this is very interesting, I think, because you know we've had to take PET scans, thousands of dollars, very expensive, uh, to get an idea or looking at MRIs, now you can take blood tests. Now that's scary for people because they say, I don't want to know if my blood test shows that I'm in the early stages. Yes, you do want to know. We all want to know because there's so much you can now do about it. Literally, if everybody would get these tests early on, look to see if they're headed for Alzheimer's and then get on appropriate prevention, there would be very little Alzheimer's. So PTAL-181, what that is doing is it's showing you in an Alzheimer's-associated way if the tau, which is a fastener, tau is literally like bolts, allowing your neurites to grow out and make these connections. When you want to pull that back, 
you phosphorylate your tau and that pulls the tau off the, the pulls the bolt off and allows you to pull back. So when you are in that synaptoclastic state, your phospho tau is going up 181 and also this phospho tau 217. Okay, if that's high, do the right things. You should now be able to follow it down. It takes about six months to go down, but you want to be able to do that. Now, this has just become commercially available through LabCorp, the 181. The 217 hasn't become commercially available yet. It's still used in trials. And I should say we're using all of these in our upcoming trial, this trial that's just starting. And the third one then is A-beta 42. This tells you something different. This tells you as the 42 goes down, it's saying you've got inflammation going on. You are now lowering your the 42 that's peripheral. You're keeping it centrally to fight the various pathogens, et cetera. Neurofilament light is not specific, but it says, do I have neuronal damage from anything, from trauma, from ALS, from Alzheimer's? So it's complementary to the other things. And then finally, GFAP, glial fibrillary acidic protein, very much complementary. It is nonspecific. It tells you that your astrocytes are activated, which happens very early on in Alzheimer's. So the good news is it's the first of all these tests to go up. Great way to find out early on. The bad news is that it's not specific for Alzheimer's, unlike P-TAU 181 and P-TAU 217. It, uh, it can be, a, you know, it could be that you had a car accident. It could be that you've got a different disease going on, but it's an early warning system. Again, to find out what's going on, get on active prevention. So I believe that within a few years, we're all going to be doing this. We're all going to be finding out if we are headed for a problem and we're all going to be stopping it so that we literally can put an end to this problem with the current generation. All right, we've published papers on this. So this, these are all freely available online. You can read them. You can read and see our data. Uh, also published three books, The End of Alzheimer's, which is now available in 33 languages, The End of Alzheimer's Program, because people wanted more detail I know. So what do we actually do? Uh, and then the, the first survivors of Alzheimer's, and this has seven different people who developed Alzheimer's and then all did very, very well. They all wrote their own stories. They're all still doing very, very well. So it's just, and I, I would challenge you to read their stories uh, without a tear coming to your eye. It's really striking to hear about their relatives dying and hear about them having problems and then getting better and then you know, preventing their children from having the problem in the future. Um, so just to finish up with the ARC project here, um, the idea then is we want to take this out, what we're doing with Alzheimer's, which literally says there's a supply-demand mismatch, too little supply, too much demand. This is for the neuroplasticity network, but there are different sub-networks. There is a motor control network that's critical for Parkinson's disease. There is a motor power network that is critical for ALS. There are the macula that are critical for macular degeneration. We believe that all of these represent chronic or repeated mismatches between supply and demand. And each one has a different Achilles heel. Each one has a different supply set and a different demand set. So we should be able to adapt the same thing to each of these. And we're actually just interacting with other groups to do just that. We have some nice early results with people with dry macular degeneration. So very enthusiastic. We want to make it so these neurodegenerative diseases uh, are, are a thing of the past. So one of my favorite quotes here is actually from a rabbi, from Rabbi Tarfan, who said, you're not expected to complete your life's work during your lifetime, neither are you excused from it. So I'm 70, I'm just about to turn 71. So th there's a lot more work to do here. And this is gonna go on for many years after I'm gone. But I, my hope is that we will make it so that these diseases, which have been so horrible for my generation, are things that nobody needs to worry about. So thanks very much. Thanks to Michael, thanks to Stephen for the invitation and happy to take some questions. Thank you very much for that informative presentation. So we're now gonna begin our live q and I'll be asking questions as well as opening up the questions to the audience. But before we do, uh, we'd like to give you the opportunity to tell us where to get your books and where to follow you online. Yes, thank you. So yeah, you can you can get the books uh, from Amazon, basically wherever books are sold. Um, these came out from, uh, from uh, Random House, uh, Avery. 
Uh, and so you can get them uh, anywhere. You can get them in, um, you know, Barnes and Noble, uh, get them on Amazon, you know, et cetera. Um, I know for a while they had them in Costco. I think Costco has run out of them now, um, but you can get them, you know, wherever good books are sold. As far as online, uh, thanks for asking. Yeah, so there's a Facebook, uh, Dr. Dale Bredesen, uh, also on Twitter, uh, also on Instagram, all Dr. Dale Bredesen. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. So we'll now begin our Q&A session. We'll be asking questions of the presenter. Uh, and uh, if the audience has questions, we'll open it up to take questions from them. We will uh, just want to explain to everyone how this works. We don't take questions directly from the chat. Instead, we ask everyone to virtually raise their hand if you're not sure how to do that. What you need to do is click on the reactions button on the bottom right of the Zoom window, second from the right. Then click on the raise hand function and in, in the menu that pops up. We will then take questions in the order in which we receive them. When it's your turn, I will unmute you and prompt you to state your name, where you're from, and ask your question. We ask that everyone keep their questions brief and on topic. We will then mute you. In order to give everyone a chance to get their questions answered, we won't be taking follow-up questions. However, if you would like to give a follow-up question and there's still time, you can just hop on and, and raise your hand again, and we will repeat to uh, to um, take questions in the order in which they're received. So we've got a couple of questions from the audience. So let's go ahead and start with uh, uh, Judy. Go ahead and state your name, where you're from, and your question. Hi, my name is Judy, and I'm from um, the Philadelphia suburbs. And if you have somebody who is a whole food plant-based or a vegan, and that person's underweight, do you still recommend the uh, the fasting and the low carb, um, especially if somebody mm -hmm. is having a hard time holding on and with bone density and things like that. That's a great point. And this is one of the most common things that comes up. So I, what I recommend then is some, you know, fat bombs, um, keep, you know, keep your weight up. You can cycle off once or twice a week. Um, you have some things like, uh, you know, like sweet potatoes and things like that. Um, but you want to have, you want to, again, the goals are two critical goals. You want to be able to burn glucose and ketones. So you want to give yourself some ketones at the beginning. Um, now, depends then on what your LDL particle number are you. If you have cardiac disease, you probably don't want to take a lot of MCT oil. Um, but you can use, if you don't, you can use things like coconut oil or MCT oil, um, along with things like uh, exogenous ketones, things like KE1, ketone salts or esters to help you slowly get in. And you're absolutely right. You have to be very careful. Remember that this is ultimately a network insufficiency. So the last thing you want to do is take someone who's barely making it and then put them on a long fasting period. They'll get worse, not better. So does that make sense? So you want to be able to give them enough fats and protein to make it so that they don't have, that they don't contribute to their, uh, you know, to, to their, uh, 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 to their uh, weight loss, you know, you don't, you don't want to drop them down. And that, that is something that comes up a lot. So help them get into a, a healthy uh, BMI range. So um, should we be taking exogenous ketones if we are healthy? You know, that is such a good point. Because in general, what we say is, for people who are truly in the prevention mode, you're totally healthy, everything's good, no need. No, I wouldn't recommend exogenous ketones for those people. Um, they should be getting naturally in and out of ketosis. They should be metabolically flexible. You should be going in and you should have each night, you know, you're, you should be doing that 12 to 16 hour fast at night. You know, if you finish your dinner at seven, you probably don't want to start eating before 7 a.m. because of that same phenomenon. You want to have time to clean out your brain. You want to have that time for autophagy. It reduces your overall inflammation. It will help you to stay non-inflammatory longer. However, once you cross over, once you now start to have some complaints, when that SCI phase, and you're saying, you know, things aren't quite perfect, or if you've already found that you have an abnormal PET scan, or you find that already the blood tests are abnormal, any of those things, now the process has started. 
So now you do want to start yourself on some ketones. And in the long run, many people will not need exogenous ketones. They just get into endogenous ketosis. But again, I'm always telling people, be careful. You try to rush someone to, into endogenous ketosis, you can make them worse because you're taking away that fuel for your brain. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Lakeisha. Lakeisha, please state your name, where you're from, and ask your question. Hi, my name is Lakeisha Peterson. Hey. And my question is, is there any truth to people that care for and take care of people with Alzheimer's, you know, family members, do they end up developing it themselves? And if so, how do you protect yourself from it? You know, you brought up a really important point, Lakeisha. So thank you for asking that. Um, what has been shown is that people who care for people with cognitive decline have increased stress levels. So for example, they have shorter telomeres. This is suggestive of stress. So you've got to take some me time. You really, if you're, uh, if you're caring for someone like this, please do some things to reduce stress, whether you like Shinroku or whether you like biofeedback or you like, you know, happy music, whatever it is you love. You should be doing that. Now, do they increase the risk? Now, the, the main or major risk for Alzheimer's is the genetic risk for the, the people who are taking care of them. But all these other things that we've talked about contribute. And so therefore, and when I say the major risk, I'm talking about family members who's care, who are caring for someone. And yes, stress is one of the risk factors for cognitive decline. So I would recommend anyone who is a caretaker please get on active prevention. So what happens in your brain, if you remember, I was showing that, that area in your brainstem, in your pons, that is called the locus ceruleus. This sends out norepinephrine neurons, synapses now, to multiple places. But two of them are hippocampus, which is what decreases in Alzheimer's and which is what is, and what is associated with forming new memories but interestingly also to your amygdala. Your amygdala is where you're responding to that stress and threat. So that feeling of there's ongoing insults, it's not just biochemical insults, it's not just pathogen insults, it's also mental insults and things like ACEs that we've heard so much about with childhood um, and ongoing stress. So yes, uh, I would recommend anyone who is a caretaker, please get evaluated, get on active prevention. We developed a program called Precode um, that's easy to get on and easy to do to help to prevent the, pro the problem. Now, if you ever should develop a problem, then of course you wanna move on to more evaluation and more treatment. Thank you, doctor. What is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Yeah, great point. So Alzheimer's disease is the underlying process. And it is a cause of SCI and MCI and dementia. It is the most common cause of dementia. If you take all the people with global cognitive decline, and by dementia, we mean global cognitive decline, about two thirds of them start with memory problems and then have other problems. But the other third starts with other things, problems with planning, problems with paying bills, problems with recognizing faces, problems with word finding, problem with navigation and getting lost, all these sorts of things happen as well. And ultimately, of course, you lose all of those things. There are other causes of dementia, such as frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, and things like that, Parkinson's associated dementia, all of those. Vascular dementia, another relatively common one, but the most common cause by far is Alzheimer's. Now, the Alzheimer's process starts early on, typically in your 30s and 40s, uh, but you don't know until later. And so it's a cause of dementia. But the good news is it gives us a long period of time, just like insulin resistance and prediabetes give us a long time to prevent full-on diabetes. We have the same situation with Alzheimer's disease. Thank you very much. Our next question is coming from Kaylee. Kaylee, please state your name, where you're from, and ask your question. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. You, you've been wonderful. My name is Kaylee Covington, and I'm from uh, Plainview, Syosset, New York. Um, two, two parts of this, really. Um, if we want to volunteer for being one of the, the for one of the studies, yes. um, whom would we contact? And is it possible to, in, to be, participate without it taking uh, pharmaceuticals, but could include fasting? Um, 
And then um, do you have something specific for dissolving cataracts? Yeah, good, good point. So um, as far as cataracts, I'm not an ophthalmologist. And so I would, I would certainly just go to the ophthalmologists um, and they're very good at removing cataracts. That's actually one of the areas where classical medicine has been extremely successful. There are things, as you know, on the market, carnosine related drops that are supposed to, to dissolve cataracts. They have, they work a little bit, you know, if you start early, <clears throat> they haven't, excuse me, they haven't worked particularly well. So as far as the trial, uh, the, you have to live within one hour car drive of one of those six sites. So there's, we don't have one in New York yet. You might want to check with, uh, with uh, what's called age well simply this is uh this is Carrie Mills Rutland who's done a fabulous job um she is just outside of New York City and she's seen a number of people and they're actually uh, sending them to the right physicians etc they've organized things beautifully and she's really worked with people i do think the role for health coaches uh is such a huge one uh to get people to the right places to get them doing the right things to do all the all the right things to follow them to to do all the things that give you best outcomes so i would encourage you to talk with Carrie or a member of her team um if we do future trials there there certainly may be one uh, in new york but this this particular one um we unfortunately don't have any of the the practitioners um in new york thank you doctor so you mentioned uh, sugar and eliminating simple sugars. So yeah. should somebody who is generally healthy be avoiding sugars with the anticipation that they could contribute to Alzheimer's and other cognitive issues? And um, how much should we avoid fruit on a plant-based diet with that in mind? Great point. And the bottom line is, as Dr. Johnson himself has said, um, fruit is not a big deal. Yeah, you don't eat 200 pears. Okay, I mean, these... The, the the animals, the primates that do this you know, right before winter, um, they will actually literally eat 200 pieces of fruit um, and they'll get these big bellies. I mean, they're, they're storing fat like crazy for the winter. Um, you, if you have a few pieces of fruit, and of course we like the, uh, the, low, the lower carb fruits, the lower glycemic index fruits, and I'm sure many other speakers at this conference would say the same thing, things like uh, blueberries and, and raspberries and things like that. And the tropical fruits, you kind of want to stay away from things with very high glycemic uh, indices. So the, the, that's important. Um, now, as far as the, you know, as far as uh, fruit and fructose and, and carbs, yes, you want to avoid, you know, this is the, the interesting thing. Two pieces to this. Number one, when we say we're healthy, it's because typically no one's looked. Our definition of health, um, unfortunately, is, is, is a very uh, generic one. Um, people walking around with, uh, and you saw the guy with fasting insulin of 32. Uh, you, you should be walking around with a fasting insulin that's about four or five, not 32, uh, and maybe even less, maybe even two or three. Um, you know, and, and so the bottom line is many of us are in the earliest stages of changes for things like uh, insulin resistance without knowing it. So when you say healthy, yes, if you are extremely healthy and, you're, and everything is great, uh, fine. You, your humans uh, do pretty well with metabolizing very small amounts of sugar, although I wouldn't recommend it, but, you know, a few grams. But we're typically exposed to 40, 50, 60. I mean, you drink one soda, you may have 40 grams of sugar. Um, this is horrible. So the, the, what's really happened is we have not been designed evolutionarily to live the way we are living. And unfortunately, companies have made billions of dollars um, without care, you know, unfortunately, without caring about your health, just producing things because, yes, we are, again, evolutionarily programmed to get that, you know, quick hit. When I was an intern and staying up all night taking care of patients, I would be really running out of gas about 3 or 4 a.m., but I still had more patients waiting and had more hours to see people. I had to stay up all the next day and maybe all the next night. So what would I do? I'd take a slug of some things that were sweet, give me some energy or, you know, or some caffeine, things like that. Um, but it's horrible for your health in the long run. This is why we want to know hemoglobin A1C, fasting insulin, for some people, even a glucose tolerance test. So the bottom line is 
even for healthy people, it's not a good idea to be having carbs. We really, again, we weren't made to live this way. And how about fats contribution to uh, raising insulin? Should we be avoiding fats for the same reason we would be avoiding the, the more? No, actually. F- so the, the reality is we should be getting, and it go, everybody has things they want to tweak a little this way. So I, I you know, I, I give credit fully to them. We're, I'm just going by what helps you make and keep synapses and prevent you from getting dementia. And the thing that works best is KetoFlex 12.3, a plant-rich, mildly ketogenic, high good fats, monounsaturates and polyunsaturates, lower in saturated fats, uh, we, you know, low so we, with, with uh, plenty of phytonutrients, with fasting periods at night of 12 to 16 hours. If you're APOE4 positive, you want to go 14 to 16 hours. If you're negative, 12 to 14 hours at night. This gives you time. You want to have appropriate gut function. You want to feed your microbiome. And as Dr. Lustig points out, you know, feed your gut and protect your liver. These are critical. Uh, and so, the, you know, the putting this together was basically a way to do that. And so, yes, you're ending up with m- many of your calories, most of your calories coming from good fats, from avocados and, and nuts and salads, uh, things like that with, you know, appropriate. And to be fair, salads, yes, they have carbs, but they have complex carbs, not simple carbs. And you want to stay away from the things that are pro-inflammatory, um, you know, things like dairy uh, and things like gluten. These are unfortunately inflammatory substances. So again, to keep your brain in best uh, best situation, KetoFlex 12.3 has worked better than anything else so far. You mentioned avocados and nuts as healthy sources. Are there particular yeah. nuts that are healthy, seeds, anything that in particular that is is better than anything else? Yeah, I mean, definitely seeds, whatever. And I would, you know, I would, again, go across the board. You know, uh, people argue against almonds sometimes because they are a monoculture, but almonds are fine. Pistachios are fine. Walnuts are excellent. I mean, on and on. Now, to be, again, to be fair, you want a handful. You don't want to have a a jar full because they are high in omega-6s. You don't want to go too high on your omega sixes. You want to have a good omega three to omega six level, and you can get that from things like uh, wild caught salmon uh, and the so called smash fish. You know, salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, and herring. Little fish. You don't want to go to the mercury laden big guys like shark and tuna. Uh, and so, doing that, and then also taking some uh, omega three, taking some fish oil or krill oil. Uh, can be very, very helpful to give you an appropriate uh, level. Um, And yes, you know, all sorts of seeds that you can take from, you know, pumpkin seeds, for example, Um, there are all sorts of ones. And I would defer to uh, to, to Dr. Furman, who's who's spent his career looking at optimal diets for health. And I really believe in his work. So again, we focus very much on what does it take to make and keep synapses in your brain? Thank you. How many people have you treated personally with this protocol? And of those people who stuck to the protocol, how many of them got better? Yeah. So first of all, it's a great point and it sounds simple, but it's not. There are, so there are over 7,000 people who've gone on this protocol. We've, you can read the papers. We've, we just published a couple hundred more um, in biomedicines. So we've got a publication on a number of them. Um, personally, what I'm typically doing as a researcher, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm a research neurologist. So I'm mostly working with the health coaches and the doctors who are taking care of the patients. Now, yes, I did uh, take care of the first 20 or so myself. Um, and, and of those, about 90% of them improved. But that doesn't really give you the, the most accurate number. In our trial, um, 84% of the people improved their cognition on CNS vital signs, 76% improved on uh, uh, on the MOCA scores. Uh, but when we looked at people out in the community practicing this, it was only about 50%. So it does definitely make a difference. And going to someone who's doing this uh, and has done it for a while and is good at it, it makes a big difference. We have people who are getting, rare people getting better. We have people who are where the vast majority of people are getting better. So it does depend a lot on your practitioner. It depends a lot on your health coach. It depends a lot on what's causing it. It depends a lot on your compliance, all of these things. And again, it depends on how far along you are. So 
If you ask me SCI, we've made virtually 100% of the SCI people better. If you ask me about MCI, I would say in a good situation, it's going to be about 80% better and 20% not better. If you ask me about dementia, then I would say it's going to be more like 50-50 or even 30-70. Uh, because, it again, it depends on how far along you are and a lot of other variables. What does the S stand for in SCI? Subjective cognitive impairment. Okay. So these are the people where, you know, you know there's something wrong. And one of the big problems we've run into is your doctor will tell you, oh, you're just getting a little older. And, you know, I hear about this all the time and it really makes me sad because it's one of the things that has delayed people getting in and doing the right thing. We had a, a person recently uh, who came in and who actually was already in the fourth stage, already into dementia, had gone into a neurologist who said, oh, this is just normal aging. You don't have to worry. And I mean, this was nothing could be further from the truth. This person should have gotten in a few years earlier. So please, again, uh, please come in early and get uh, get tested and get treated. Speaking of coming in early, what are the initial symptoms that should bring a person to seek help? Yeah, great point. So all the things that we talked about, any sort of memory problem, um, people will often say, oh, if you just forgot your keys, that's not a problem. Well, anything that's a change from before, if you usually remember your keys and now you're routinely forgetting your keys, <clears throat> that's not normal. That that something has changed. <clears throat> and there's, I would check out either again, freely available online, AQ21. That asks some basic questions. Are you having trouble remembering your keys? Do you have trouble remembering where you parked your car? So memory. Um, are you having navigation problems? One of the common things you hear is that people will pull up to a stop sign and suddenly realize gee, this is a, a familiar place, but I really don't know which way to turn. And that's telling you you're having some problems that should be evaluated. Um, uh, recognition of faces is another common one. People will say, you know, I just don't remember. I, I don't remember that face. Like, oh, I'm Joe, your old friend. Oh, yeah, okay, I gotcha. Um, people that they've recognized, that, that they've, uh, you know, that they knew from, from recently or someone that they just met recently, they, they, they will completely forget their face. Problems calculating a tip. So calculation problems paying bills, uh, problems navigating with your driving, not just pulling up to a stop sign, but any sort of navigation with your driving. Um, uh, word finding is a, is a relatively common one and recognition of shapes is another one. Um, so remember, uh, executive function, common. So problems with planning. The uh, common one I hear is I got a new you know, iPhone, iPad, what have you, and I'm having trouble adjusting to it, or I got a new car and figuring out how to adjust to new things. That's another common one. Yes. Having trouble doing their job. Any of those things, please get evaluated and get things better. Thank you. You mentioned curcumin uh, as yes. uh, that, that's helpful. We actually had <clears throat> Dr. Sunil Pai earlier discussing, <clears throat> uh, I don't know if you're familiar with, uh, with the part that he has that is curcumin based. Uh, it is Curcumin is something that we should supplement with in order to prevent Alzheimer's? Yeah. So, you know, there's all, again, there are all sorts of, you could, we could spend hours talking about all the different pieces. The great news is the armamentarium for cognitive change is now huge. We've been told over the years that there is nothing in the armamentarium. There's nothing you can do to prevent or reverse or delay. No, that's not true. There's a tremendous amount you can do. And curcumin is one of a hundred things. So it depends. If you are especially, uh, you know, have some inflammation, curcumin is excellent for inflammation. Um, if you have some amyloid, curcumin is excellent. It binds to amyloid and helps remove it. So I like curcumin as one of many things, but there are other things. Um, pregnenolone can be helpful for some people. Omega-3s. I really like, uh, I really like you know, the... Um, uh, I really like the NeuroQ, which is one that actually I worked with a group to develop that. It's got six different things in it, including curcumin, including propolis and things that has worked very well for many people. Um, I really like also uh, the SPM Active was designed by Metagenics. And this was designed based on Professor Charles Searhan from Harvard's work, um, who showed that it's not just about anti-inflammatories. It's also about resolving ongoing inflammation. And they created a product, Metagenics, I think did a really nice job. Uh, and you know, I have nothing to do with Metagenics or anything. I don't get anything for saying this. Uh, we're always just looking for the same thing. 
which is how do we get best outcomes? And I like their product for that. Um, there's another one, Artiracil, which is for vessels. Again, I don't have anything to do with that company, but it's a, it's a nice one that people have used for the blood vessel, uh, uh, for blood vessel health. Uh, and then of course, things that improve your nitric oxide for so many people with vascular issues, um, that's a, those are good. So the bottom line is there's so much that can be done and therefore finding out where you stand, working with a trained practitioner, we've now trained over 2000 physicians to do this protocol. Uh, and you can see this on um, my, again, my, mycognoscopy.com. Find someone who's, who's doing a good job and work with them. So many of the people who come to attend the <coughs> are very proactive with their health and are looking to right. not reverse, but prevent getting Alzheimer's in the first place. What would be right. the best ways? You know, we talked about some of the supplementation, but it sounded like that was more once you have it, this, these are things you can do. What are the best things that we can do in order to prevent getting Alzheimer's in the first place? Yeah, and there, there are no question. I mean, there are supplements that are very helpful with for prevention. So we, we developed something called Precode for prevention of cognitive decline. Recode is for reversal of cognitive decline. And so those things are very helpful and, and people can get on those. But there are what we call the seven basics. So that's diet. And we talked about a you know mildly ketogenic plant-rich diet, exercise, and some really nice new things. Um, if you people haven't tried katsu bands, especially for some of the older people, um, they can be very helpful. These are uh, bands that are that are restriction bands that actually can essentially give you more bang for your buck. Um, there's also EWOT, exercise with oxygen therapy, which improves, it gives you not only blood flow, the exercise, but also improves your oxygenation. So I really like EWOT, and there are some patients who, who've done really well on EWOT. Uh, and so um, then, so exercise, and you want to do both strength training and aerobics. And then sleep. You could spend hours talking just about sleep. And of course, Professor Matthew Walker from Berkeley right near here has done a very nice job in his book, why we sleep, showing how important this is. And I just check mine, you know, you can do it with wearables, things like Oura rings, um, uh, Apple watches, whatever you like, find out, are you getting seven to eight hours of sleep? Are you getting at least an hour and a half of REM sleep and at least one hour of deep sleep each night? Do you have reduction in your oxygenation? Um, you want to make sure that you're not dropping your oxygen. It's so common, not just for people who have uh, sleep apnea, but also for people who have upper airway resistance syndrome. Very common to drop this, your oxygenation. You're hurting yourself then while you're sleeping. Get that oxygen up. You want to be in the 90s, preferably above 92, and if optimally would be in the 96 to 98 percent saturation there. So sleep is important during that time. Of course, you're cleansing the brain. Um, and then stress management. As I mentioned earlier, stress is one of the common contributors. So check your heart rate variability. Are you sitting up there at you know 70 and 80 each day? Or are you sitting down there more like 15 or 20 each day? You want to have your heart rate variability be good and do some things that will improve it. Just some deep breathing, just some meditation, whatever it is that brings you joy and relaxation can be so helpful for your heart rate variability. So those are the top four. And then there's brain training, detox, and some targeted supplements. And you, you mentioned supplements. Yeah, things like curcumin and fish oil and make sure your vitamin D is enough and make sure your magnesium uh, is up to snuff. Uh, all these things uh, can be very, very helpful. Um, and even taking a few months of the SPM active, the, the, uh, these resolvents that I think can be very, very helpful. So those are the basics. Then beyond that, if you ever have any problems, then you want to look into it further. You want to find out, do I have gut pathogens? Do I have leaky gut? Um, so again, and if you want to be uh, active about prevention, find out if you have a leaky gut, do a, do a sample. You'll look to see if you've got any sort of GI issues. Check your oral DNA, which is easy to do now. Um, there's a group called My Periopath that does uh, oral DNA. So you can see if you have any of these things that could otherwise get into your brain and give you a problem. Uh, and, you know, do some training. Uh, we like Brain HQ just because that's the one, again, that's been published the most. Brain HQ doesn't give me anything to say that, but it's the one that's been published the most. And Professor Mike Mersnick, who won the Kavli Prize a few years ago, 
which is a bit like the Nobel Prize for just tremendous work he's done over the years. Um, he is the father of neuroplasticity and brain training. So all these things can be so helpful. But the main thing is, if you're doing them, great. If you're starting to have problems, then please get in and see someone to find out what's driving the problem. With regard to leaky gut, do you suggest probiotics or fermented foods as a way of healing the gut? Yeah, well, first of all, I think you want to spend a few weeks healing it up. And again, I would defer to the, the, the real gut experts that you're talking to. But from the brain standpoint, absolutely, there's you know about the gut-brain connection. It's amazing how important that has turned out to be. And you may have seen the recent very nice uh, piece of work looking at uh, a specific bacterium called desulfovibrio that's turned out to be related to Parkinson's disease. And as you have increase in that specific gut organism, you increase your risk for Parkinson's disease. So there is this amazing connection. Uh, and so, yes, we like things like bone broth um, and a non-toxic bone broth. Again, fire and kettle, I have no relationship with them, but it's a bit a good one. Some people make their own, that's fine. You don't want, again, you don't want the ones uh, from uh, toxic livestock, but that's that one I, I, I like a lot. Um, DGL, I like a lot also for gut healing. And then, as you said, um, things like uh, probutyrate um, from Tesseract um, has done, they, they, again, they've done a nice job. Uh, and uh, healing up the gut, uh, improving your, your uh, probiotics and prebiotics, um, the, these are all things that can be very, very helpful. And then, of course, SIBO has, uh, has turned out to be an issue, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So anyone who's having any issues with the gut, and especially any bloating, things like that, upward pressure, things like that, GERD, please look into whether you might have SIBO. It's very treatable and it's something that can be a problem. In the whole food community, we like to think that we're, we're bulletproof from a lot of diseases. Does a whole food plant-based diet reduce the risk of getting Alzheimer's? No question. I mean, there have been publications, for example, just on Mediterranean diet, which really isn't particularly good for getting into ketosis, but it does many of the other things right. Um, and the so-called mind diet, uh, no question, having the right diet decreases your risk for Alzheimer's. You know, interestingly, some very interesting work from years ago just showed blueberries alone, blueberry consumption has a modest effect to decrease risk. So all of these things, again, it fits with the model that I showed you perfectly. You've got energetics, you've got inflammation, and these things are critical. And diet, no question, can feed both the reduction in the inflammation and increase in the energetics part. Okay, it's gonna be our last question. So just if we can make it a brief one. Um, sure. Things like tackle football contribute to Alzheimer's and mm -hmm. how about soccer players that that head the ball? Basically, I guess any sort of brain injury, uh, you know, minor concussions or, or major concussions and their contribution to Alzheimer's. It's such a good point. And it's a tough one because we all love football. We all love watching football on the weekends and, and you know, uh, watching your kids play soccer and all these things. But yes, head injury, especially repeated inj injury, especially with loss of consciousness. There's just no question. It does damage the brain and it does increase your risk for cognitive decline, both on the so-called CTE, uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And I should mention that has a triad, aggression, depression, dementia. So if you see people who've had head trauma in the past, to being becoming more aggressive, depressed, and demented, think about CTE. That is important. That's important. And there are things you can do to treat that one as well. But you're right. It does increase risk. Uh, traffic accidents increase your risk. So if you're going to be on a motorcycle, please get a helmet on. Um, if you're thinking, if you're, if you're trying to decide between uh, playing uh, tackle football versus playing baseball, uh, you, you might want to think maybe, of course, baseball, you can have head injuries too. Uh, maybe you think about running track. Uh, maybe that would be a little bit better, but yes, it's an issue. You might also want to check to see if you're APOE4 positive because you have a worse outcome for APOE4 positive if you have head trauma. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you for all the information that you shared with us today. We're going to Thank briefly you. unmute the audience so they can also share in the, uh, their thanks for all the information that you gave. 
Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Amazing.